Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So before I talk to the HT, I'm going to step back and try to put the work in a bit of context. In the last 20 years or so, there's been uh, two branches of work in distributed systems. Uh, the first is what are called transparent distributed systems. And these are systems that came about when local area networks became popular. And they are usually a few nodes connected by a local area network. And the goal of these systems is to blur the distinction between local and remote resources. So if you're using something like the heart file system, you may not realize you're talking to five different machines. To you, it looks like a single machine. At the same time, we're developing applications for the internet, and the goal is a little different here. We're simply trying to communicate across a wide area. So there's no pretensions about transparency. When you're using the World Wide Web, the users definitely understand the talking machine that's on the other side of the world. So what we see happening is these two uh, branches coming together to form a new class of systems we call internet distributed systems. And the goal here is to take the best of both worlds. We want the scale of the internet, both in geography and in the number of nodes, with the transparency of distributed systems. So of course, the real goal is to get our hands on a lot of resources cheaply. Cheaply because maybe there are nodes that aren't ours, but we're going to volunteer their resources. And also because it's really easy to manage these transparent systems that do things like handle failure and joins on their own. So this convergence has brought together a lot of enabled a new set of applications, we hope. Uh, you probably use many of these, file sharing IAM, all these examples of, of systems that run uh, over the wide area that have the properties of transparent systems. And we're able to build these today where we weren't in the past because of some technology trends. You know, PCs have gotten faster and more powerful, obviously. But most importantly, I think, is that more and more people have access to uh, fast links in their home. It's actually kind of a lot funnier than I expected. Isn't it? So we just had a, uh, we were just talking earlier today about a broad, broadly what distributed systems were. And we put exactly those three words. Internet distributed systems? <laughs> Communication, <laughs> storage, and computation. Oh, great. Well. <laughs> I see we have a lot of synergy here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should say, while, while we're, we're just talking, please feel free to, to interrupt at any time. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about my group at MIT, but we're legendary for giving speakers a hard time. So please uh, <laughs> well, feel free to carry on with that tradition then. All right, so what, are, you know, what I'm actually talking about, despite calling your distributed system, is peer-to-peer -peer systems, uh, more commonly known. And there's two branches of these. You, Probably all use file sharing applications. Hope you haven't gotten caught yet. Um, and those are great for what they do. Uh, you can trade you can trade files with those, but they're very application specific, and a lot of them have some scalability problems. And the same time, there's been a ton of work recently uh, in the research area on distributed systems. And I think uh, our group at MIT takes some blame if you're tired of seeing uh, these things at OSI and SSP. And if you give the query peer to peer to sites here, it's more than enough sites to make it to go into panic mode. But you probably haven't seen one of these prototypes on your desk yet. That's because there's a lot of challenges still to be solved on uh, these applications, some algorithmic, but a lot of them uh, very system engineering problems. And that's what I've spent a lot of my time doing, is trying to make, take these research prototypes and make them more practical. Let's look at what those challenges are. Well, first, scale. We expect a lot of nodes in these systems. And that's great. It gives us a chance to use a lot of resources. Uh, but it also gives us a problem locating data in these large networks. In a handful of machines, it's pretty easy to find your data. We're talking about thousands. Uh, location is going to be a difficult problem. As we have many more nodes, uh, we also give ourselves a reliability problem. We expect these nodes to be on the wide area, which gives us a lot more complicated interconnects. So with many nodes, many connections, lots of links, we expect those links to fail more frequently. Also, these volunteer servers, not as reliable as the machines we put in machine rooms. Uh, finally, because we spread the machines around the world, we have to deal with latency. Uh, when you're talking about a global deployment, you can't engineer uh, the speed of light away. So we're going to try to work around these problems to still give our users the low latency they might expect. All right, so the particular tool I'm going to talk to you about that has to deal with these problems is called a distributed hash table. I'm sure this group are all familiar with this. Um, it's usually organized in a layered architecture. The DHT is in the middle. We call it a hash table because in an application, that's exactly what it looks like. Applications can call put and get on the hash table, and uh, it'll store the data and return it later when the key is presented. The distributed hash table is on top of a lookup service, and that solves the problem of locating data uh, in the system of a large number of nodes. A little particular lookup service I'll talk about uh, as background. It's called Core, developed at MIT. So the goal of the distributed hash table is to give system builders a new tool. 
Right now, if you sit down to build one of these systems, you basically get the tools we've had for the past 20 years, RPC, TCP, the domain name service. And these are very low-level tools. Uh, DHT is a new tool to build these systems, one of the hope offers a little higher level and makes it easier to build these systems. Uh, the particular DHT that we're talking about is called DHASH. Uh, it was implemented uh, at MIT. And we're running on a Plan 11 ROM test bed. So uh, here's a Plan 11, the global test bed that Intel was uh, kind enough to provide the resources for. So we've been running it there for um, several years. It's a pretty big, uh, reasonably big project, about 25,000 lines of code to, to the core. And, uh, and if you get excited about this talk, you can download source code later. That's uh, the MIT license, so your lawyers shouldn't complain too much. <laughs> but most of what I'll talk about is a series of problems that we came across while deploying the system. So it's a lot of, a lot of engineers necessary to get it running. Uh, it's just a tantalized example that I actually won't talk about. One thing you might not say is that TCP turned out to be unsuitable to network transport. I won't have time to talk about that, but I will talk about solving a lot of latency problems with this uh, system. In terms of latency prediction, was, a, was proved to be very important. All right. So first I'll tell you a little about cord background, just so you can understand where dehash is coming from. And the focus of this talk will be on Vivaldi. It's a synthetic coordinate system that will just predict round trip times without actually making measurements. And this was important in making cord perform well. Uh, something I won't have time to talk about is STP. It's a congestion control protocol that works well for DHT, as well traditional congestion control protocols do not. Uh, feel free to ask me about that. I know we have a large slot here, so if uh, we have time at the end, if you're interested in that, I'll be happy to, to go over it. And also, like a few applications we've built on top of the system. CFS is a file distribution system, and we have a Usenet replacement called Usenet DHT. And hopefully I'll give you some little bits of wisdom about what it takes to deploy these large systems uh, on the real network. Uh, so that's what DHT is. Uh, to use some motivation on why you might actually want to use one, let me tell you about how we adapted Usenet to work on DHT. I don't know if anyone's ever, probably all of you have used Usenet, one of the older distributed systems on the internet. That's a bulletin board system, and uh, it's very expensive to run these days. So to, not, to host in a full Usenet feed requires about 1.4 terabytes a day. If you divide that by the number of seconds a day, it's about 100 megabits a second, 24 hours a day. So depending on the deal you can get from your ISP, uh, you know, something like the OC3, you'll need to download that. It'll cost you maybe $10,000 a month. And they have to pay for the storage costs. Obviously, you're downloading 1. terabytes a day. You have to keep it on for a little while. So you need a pretty serious uh, storage array to hold that. So only a few sites in the world can uh, Storage is cheap compared to $10,000 a month. Sure. Storage is only $2,000 a month. Anyway, go ahead. It's, it's irrelevant. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Right, well, I guess it's a 10K month. It's a big problem for a lot of, for most sites, and only a few sites can afford to uh, host this. So big universities and um, ISPs, companies that are dedicated to serving Usenet, will uh, provide you with this, uh, this service, but not many people can afford it. And the goal of Usenet DHC is to divide this cost up among a lot of cooperating nodes to make it much cheaper to run Usenet. So let's look at how Usenet works today. As a collection of servers, you see here at the right, and they form a mesh-like network. And each time an article is posted by a client, it's flooded to all the servers in the system. So this means that the storage and bandwidth costs at each site are proportional not to the articles that are read at that site, but to the articles posted anywhere in the system. Uh, we can change this cost by organizing the servers into a DHT instead of into this mesh. Instead of replicating the data at every single node, we'll store it once in the DHT, and we'll divide the, the storage cost among all the nodes equally. Uh, maybe the lesson of Usenet is that spam expands to fill the available pipe. Uh, why should we not think that kind of no matter how much storage you can allocate to Usenet or how much bandwidth, that I will always be able to shove enough, say, uh, movies into Usenet to fill it up? Well, I mean, we're trying to meet demand here. And if um, I don't know what fraction of this data is spam. I suspect not a lot, mostly because the bulk of this data is binary data. Yeah, I was so. going to say, if you remove all dot binary, you the Yeah, if you're only interested in text data, you don't have a problem. So that's only a gigabyte or so a day. That's not a big deal at all. This is almost all binary data. And, you know, I, you know, I can't, family from the environment, so I can't really talk about exactly what that data is. But uh, <laughs> people are obviously interested in it because they go to some way. <laughs> uh, to put in there. I'm, I'm only trying to meet the existing demand. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't say what would happen if, if uh, Okay. And it's not clear that Usenet's tapped out. I mean, it may be that, I don't know if we only have 1.4 terabytes, if that's all Usenet can support, or if this is all the demand. You know, I guess we'd find out if we uh, 
we made it much easier. Good question. But the, uh, the potential savings of this approach are great. So if we assume 300 nodes and that 1% of articles are read at each site, it's data we get from some Usenet server logs. Uh, the bandwidth requirements go from about 100 megabits a second to 1 megabit a second. And that's mainly because now sites only pay to download articles that their users actually read instead of downloading all articles, just in case the users might read them. And the storage requirements become much less severe, 10 terabytes a week, uh, down to 60 gigabytes a week. You can view that opportunity to save some money on your storage array, or you could decide to retain articles much longer in the system. You cache stuff locally if you read it. Yeah, you would want to cache things locally. Exactly. All right, so just one example of how DSGs uh, might come in useful in reducing the cost of a system. So in general, uh, we see DSGs as a virtual disk. So any system that sort of a database or a disk as a back end, you can chop it off, replace the DHT, and now we get uh, a robust distributed version. So for instance, CFS is a content distribution system based on the SFSRO file system. We replaced the database that that system is using with a DHT, and we got a naturally uh, distributed file system. And uh, there's been a wide variety of systems proposed on top of DHTs, everything from a new site, uh, distributed version of the site citation index, uh, to new network architectures, mail servers, traditional file sharing. So these are, uh, we think this interface has proved popular for systems builders. One thing you notice applications is that they have pretty weak consistency requirements. They're mostly sort of web-like applications. So eventual consistency is acceptable for these applications. Uh, if you want to build a distributed database, DSG might not be the right tool for you. But we think there's a lot of applications with these kind of consistency demands. All right. So it's a little bit about where we're coming from with this research. Let me tell you in some detail how the system actually works. So the first thing we need to do is solve the location problem. So <coughs> the first step in that problem is figuring out where data is stored. So we're going to map each data item to a node based on the successor relationship. So nodes and data items are given keys in a large identifier space. We use 160-bit identifier space. And the successor of a key is the first node uh, clockwise after that key in the ring. So uh, you can see key 45, you move clockwise, the first node you find is node 48. So key 45 will be stored on node 48. As you might guess from the size of these IDs, uh, we're getting these keys and identifiers by running SHA-1, either on the content of the data or on a node's IP address. All right, so that defines the relationship, but we'd like to be able to resolve it uh, in practice. We need to resolve from anywhere in the system. I don't care if you care about malicious users, but NSA and this are saying that by 2010, 160 bits will be too weak. They have new shots. It doesn't mean, probably doesn't matter for reset, but things that will deploy next decade may matter. Yeah, we're not too worried about collisions, right? We, we do assume that our hash function is collision free, and if um, you know, shot's not the right hash function, we can we can definitely switch to a different one. So, that's a good point. So to resolve this relationship, uh, we need some, the nodes will need some kind of information. The simplest information they keep is a, is a couple successor pointers. So just keep a node a pointer to the next node in the ring, the next couple nodes. You need more than one pointer in case a node that you want the ring to become disconnected. I'm going to do a really slow resolution of a successor by just following these pointers around until we have the node after the key. And uh, that would take linear time, but it would definitely work. Of course, we have to go a little faster. Keep a little extra state to do that. So we'll keep log n pointers. These are called fingers. And they're distributed around the ring so we can make quick hops around the ID space. So the first finger is half bar on the ring, the next finger is a quarter, and so on. And by following these pointers, we can resolve the su successor relationship in about log n hops. So you see node 1 hopping to uh, node 43, who can tell it that key 45 is stored on node 48. So we get the log n bound just because each finger about halves the distance to the target. So this is the look of biograms trap here. It's called core. There's a lot of other look of biograms out there. Uh, tapestry can and paste are published at the same time as cord. There are a lot of follow-ons. Most of these algorithms change the bounds of the amount of state you keep and the number of hops are required. So what I'll talk to you about today is mostly applies to the log n, log n uh, protocols, which log n state and log n hops. But dehash views the lookup algorithms of black box. So whatever your favorite lookup algorithm is, you can slide that under dehash and it should work just fine. All right, well, once we can map a key to a node, we'll do the obvious thing and store the data associated with that key on the node that uh, the key is mapped to. So we stored in a couple nodes for, for reliability. So here I show the data item 45, copied on the first three successors of uh, key 45. To be precise, the DX stores 14 fragments, erasure-coded fragments, sorry, seven of which are necessary for reconstruction. 
but that's a, that's a configurable parameter. And throughout the talk, I'll assume that these data items are small blocks. So you can conceive of storing files or whole file systems uh, on a node. In fact, we'll store small blocks. This makes load balance very easy. You don't have to worry about one node getting unlucky and getting a few big files. It also gives us a chance for high throughput uh, because we could potentially download a lot of blocks in parallel from a lot of different accesses. All right, so we built this system basically as I described it. We ran out of Planet Lab. Uh, it wasn't really all we hoped for. So in the latency department, it took about 450 milliseconds to fetch a block. That's getting the region where users are going to start to notice. And uh, remember I said we pushed 1.4 terabytes of uh, binary news group data in a day. An individual node could push about 10 kilobytes a second. So uh, obviously not exactly what we were hoping for. The uh, usenet wouldn't run on this. And uh, the rest of the talk is be describing how we improved uh, the latency of the system. Uh, solving a throughput was a whole other problem. What's that? I don't understand what the 10 kilobyte number is. That's how much a node could put out. That's how fast a single read could be satisfied. That's how fast you could download uh, a lot of blocks in parallel. So this, that's viewed from the, the readers? So from a single node, yeah. So I send out as many reads as I want, and the best I'm going to do is get a one. Yeah. Okay. That seems egregiously bad. That was egregiously bad, yeah. And it's, it's much better now. The current number is... Okay, well, I'll be interested to hear why it was so bad. It's well, that's actually... This talk is about latency, so we can, uh, we can chat so about they, that. these are doing big reads? They're doing lots of little tiny reads? This was doing a bulk read. It's, it's really horrible because we had no congestion control. Oh, yeah. you didn't use TCP and you messed up the network. Right. I get it. Okay. Using TCP didn't work either, but... <laughs> okay, I'll ask you about that. Yeah, I'm sort of taunting you guys with this. Uh, I'm only going to tell you how I fixed half this problem, but... Uh, yeah, no, I could believe you could have used congestion for lots of bad things to happen. Yeah. Yep. All right, great. So, the rest of talking about just the first half of the optimizations, uh, the latency part. The least are explained. So that's what we're talking about today. All right. So let's think about this log n routing. So, Cord gives us a small number of hops, you know. Log n is pretty great, even a million nodes is not that big a number. Unfortunately, the latency of a fetch was very high. So we want to understand what's going on here. We want to know, first, how can we reduce the latency? Uh, that's our first goal, obviously. We also know where this latency is coming from. And if we do reduce it, how close are we to the minimum achievable latency? So we're going to do this. We're going to try to understand this problem with a couple different methods. Uh, we simulated Cord uh, on a packet level simulator called P2P Sim. The most important thing about simulating these protocols is finding a reasonable set of latencies. Uh, we could possibly use topology models like the Georgia Tech model, Power Law, uh, but instead, we decided to actually measure some nodes out on the internet to avoid the, uh, the questions that come up when trying to derive latencies from topology. So we actually measure the distance between 2,000 DNS servers uh, on the net. And that's the data that we'll use to drive the simulator. The uh, median one-way latency in that data set is about 67 milliseconds. I refer to that, that quantity as delta. We also ran this on Planet Lab. Uh, Planet's a much, much smaller network. The median one-way latency in Planet Lab is about 39 milliseconds. That was in Planet Lab, about 200 nodes. 200 nodes. So, binary log, that's about eight hops you could get back. Yeah, there's a, there's a constant of one half in there, so. Yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of what you expect. All right, here's what we learned about log-in routing. Uh, the main theme that's going to go throughout this discussion of uh, routing is that the number of choices you maintain as you make multiple hops is very important. It's important to maximize that quantity. You get more, if you have more choices, you can choose a node that's nearby, reduce the latency of the operation. So we're going to look at opportunities to preserve choice both in routing, when you route to a key, and then when we download data, when we actually do the block fetch. And sort of the bottom line result is that while you might expect the latency of a lookup to scale with n, in fact it doesn't, it's only a small multiple of the median latency in the network. So to get started on this, let's look at a lookup from a different perspective. I uh, showed you a look at progressing through ID space. Here's one progressing through geographic space. So uh, just for illustrative purposes, I've plotted the latitude and longitude of all the Planet Lab nodes. And uh, here, here's a potential lookup. It starts at uh, node ABC, and it's going towards node uh, key 980. And uh, it's making good progress in ID space, you can see. It goes to node 100, and then quickly jumps to 800, uh, 900. Of course, it's making random progress in geographic space. So expect all of these hops to be quite lengthy, uh, being uh, transcontinental or transocean. 
So if the hops are random in, in this geographic space, the so that each one will cost us about delta milliseconds. That's you know, on average, it's the, the hop length. So if we're making log n hops, each cost is delta uh, milliseconds. We expect to look at about log n times delta milliseconds, which is if you, about what we saw in Planalab. Of course, if you didn't know anything about how chord works, you might expect something more like two delta. Now, if I'm going from here to California, I guess it's a bad example here. It makes more sense in Boston. But it's just about the latency to get to that place and come back. So that's, that would be something more like what we would want, rather than log n times uh, that value. So why were we making these random hops in geographic space? Well, we were choosing these fingers very rigidly in ID space. So that, because they were chosen very specifically in ID space, they were randomly distributed in the geographic space. Of course, we didn't really have to choose those fingers so rigidly. Um, while we, before we insisted that the first finger be the one that's exactly halfway on the ring from us. We can, in fact, choose anything in the other half of the ring and still achieve our log n bound. So anything in this blue shaded area is uh, valid for our first finger. So this observation is common to a lot of uh, protocols. There's a paper with a lack of diversity in the author's last names. This is the Dugumatis. Um, <laughs> they describe this very well. And uh, <laughs> what I'm going to add to this discussion is the understanding of why PNS works as well as it does and uh, give you a simple bound on, on how well you might expect to, uh, to do using PNS. So let's look at a lookup that uses PNS and see how it, how it performs. So in the first half, we have a large number of choices. Anything in this other half of the ring uh, we can choose from, so we expect to find a node that's very nearby. As the lookup proceeds, however, the number of choices we have gets smaller, simply because we're moving closer and closer to the key. In fact, it's about halved at each step. Eventually, when we get to the end of the lookup, we really have to talk to one node. There's one node that knows for sure that the key has been him and his successor. So for that lookup, for that hop, we can start to think about the latency. You know, on average, it'll be about delta, because it's, it's one particular node. Uh, and we also have to tell the guy that asked for this lookup what the answer was. Again, it's only one of those. So another cost of delta uh, for, that, for that hop in the lookup. So we could try to add up the cost of this uh, lookup. We've already got the last two hops. But we'll need something to figure out the, we'll need some uh, understanding of how long, how long the previous hops will take. So we'll make this pretty gross approximation that a hop of C choices will take about delta over C milliseconds. Uh, and this assumes something about the round trip times, namely that they're uniformly distributed. And that's pretty much true uh, for a wide variety of, uh, of round trip times. Yeah, it's basically true once you get off your local stub. This is a kind of a flat foot. And once you get into that region where geography starts to dominate, then you know, nodes are distributed randomly over the face of the Earth, so you kind of get a nice uniform growth there. All right, so given our approximation, let's try to add up the cost of this lookup. Well, we saw our two delta terms at the front of the sum there. We're talking to the uh, last hop in the requester. And the previous hop, from the, the second to last hop, probably had twice as many choices, so about delta over 2. Previous hop, twice as many again, delta over 4. If we assume an infinite number of hops, we can get a, a sum that converges, uh, something like 3 delta. So the interesting about this sum is you can compare it to log n times delta, certainly doing much better in any kind of reasonably sized network. It's also a lot more like what we expected. You know, 2 delta was sort of our ideal goal, 3 delta, uh, very little penalty. And this matches our experience both in simulation and in implementation. Uh, in simulation, it matches uh, embarrassingly well. It's exactly the same. That's just an unfortunate coincidence. I didn't uh, build a simulator that matched my rough approximation. And on uh, Planet Lab, it's close but comfortably different. So the nice thing about this result to me is that you might expect that you pay a large penalty for using a log n system. Keeping a little state is nice because if your system does get very popular, you don't talk about routing traffic getting very expensive. You know, the, the, the maintenance traffic you need to keep the system up to date. So you might be tempted to go with the system that gets much more state. However, the penalty you pay for using this, this log n system is not as severe as you might expect on first glance. So of course, if you do keep more state, you can get lower latency. But uh, this is one data point that might argue for keeping less state regardless. All right. So we were looking at the lookup phase there. And that's only, the, that's only half of the uh, problem of actually fetching a data block. So once we've identified the nodes that store the data block, we still have to choose which of those data blocks to download. So since there's replication, we do have a choice here. And by choosing the closest replica, we can, we can further reduce the latency. There's also another additional way to exploit choice here. 
As the lookup gets closer and closer to the target, the successor list, maybe we're keeping more than one successor pointer, starts to overlap with those replicas. So we can actually stop early. We can stop before we get to that final node. Remember that hop, last hop was very expensive. <clears throat> By stopping early, we avoid uh, the very costly last hop. So here's sort of the bottom line on the, on the latency optimizations. Uh, this is a bar graph that shows the median latency of a large number of lookups run in the simulator. Uh, the different bars show different optimizations applied uh, cumulatively. So I started out talking about recursive lookup. There's another way to do lookup that we, that actually, we started with that's even worse. It's called an iterative lookup. The analogy is to iterative DNS versus recursive DNS. Same idea. Um, the bar is divided into two parts. The green part of the bar is fetch, the fetch time. That's once you've acquired the list of nodes that store the data block, how long it takes to actually download those data blocks. And the black part of the bar is how long it takes to acquire that list. So by adding proximity routing to recursive lookup, we significantly reduce the lookup time while keeping the fetch time the same. By choosing uh, intelligently among the available replicas, we can reduce the fetch time while keeping the lookup time the same. And our final trick, the stop early trip where we avoid that last hop, uh, further reduces the lookup time. So what we've achieved here is about a factor of two in latency, which is, which is great and all. But more importantly, it brings the latency down to a region where it's uh, very usable for interactive use. So this makes Usenet much more feasible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me that if I understood what you're saying, when you when you fill out your finger table, you're using the, the flexibility of where you go in order to take low latency, right? That's correct. So if that's the case, then why doesn't the, the network evolve into a situation where, you know, you imagine, imagine a world where we've got, say, you know, North America, Europe, and, and Asia. Okay. Just Latencies, you know, there's a decent number of posts in each of those places, and the latencies between any pair of posts that are in separate continents are going to be very large. So what you're going to get is basically three subnetworks that route to each other, and you're only going to use the, the successor hops to hop between continents, right? Yeah, that's correct. If everything's working well, then you probably would, wouldn't talk off your own continent. You'd never talk off your own continent until you, but, but you might have to because the random hashing is going to put you in some random place, and you're just as likely to be in Europe as Although if you have, you know, if you have, if you have five replicas, it's likely one will be on your continent. So maybe you can even fetch a replica off your, off your own continent. And it just feels like this has got to, it's got to affect the. This has got to, because you have so few opportunities to cross continents. Basically, only right at the end of your routing. It, it, it feels like this is going to um, affect the robustness of the. I haven't thought about it for more than two minutes, so I could be wrong. But doesn't it seem like it, by by Well, I mean, this this is just an optimization, right? So, no, it's not just an well, I mean, you can always fall back to. You can always. I mean, the the hashing will still distribute data across all the continents. So, you know, if right. if Europe sinks into the sea, you know, we can still use the copies that are in a, in Asia or the U.S. And if you know our, our finger links fail, we can quickly find uh, find new finger links that aren't aren't in the failed area. I mean, worst case, you go back to hopping around the successors. And there, you're, you're definitely using up all the geographic diversity. Yeah, I guess. Like, like I said, I haven't thought about it very long. It just seems that, <coughs> that you're going to wind up with these, these sort of these densely connected components that don't have a lot of long node space links between them. If that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, I, 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 I see your point. Sorry, well, I, that's okay. It's, it's your research project. I just what I would, what I would, go ahead. Actually, following what <laughs> one thing that should happen is the number of hops you take probably should increase, right? I think it will increase slightly, yeah. yeah. But just maybe just by small constant. We still see so that long enough. All right, so that's really just background for this, uh, the second section, which is about Vivaldi, which is what we use to make these latency optimization is much easier to accomplish. So one of the optimizations I told you about was replica selection. And the game here is that you're given a list of uh, replicas, their IP addresses, and you want to choose the one that's closest to you. So I didn't tell you how we made that choice. So you might think of a bunch of ways to do it. 
you could ping them all. And uh, once you've measured all the latencies, all the nodes, you can choose the closest one. Unfortunately, the time it takes to make that measurement probably outweighs any savings you might get from just picking one at random. Uh, you can request all the blocks at once and take the one that gets to you first. It's great if you're only fetching one block. If you're trying to do a lot of blocks in parallel, it's, it's going to adversely impact your throughput. Uh, and you can maybe imagine caching the distance to all the nodes in the system, but it's be tough in a large system. And building a system where every node pings every other node, uh, as the planet that people have learned, is, uh, is not good for your network. So uh, does this mean that like the second to last guy is going to send back to the requester the IP addresses of all the replicas? That's right. Okay. What the requester gets is a list of, of replicas. You can imagine also that the, you, know, you, you route directly to the replicas and they just shoot the data back at the, uh, at the requester. Right. The, the problem is the same. It's, it's symmetric. Okay. Either way, they have to figure out, if, if it works that way, the replicas have to figure out which one of them is closest. Okay, I agree. And so what we're going to do is um, use network coordinates. And these were first pioneered by work uh, by Eugene Ang called GMP. So network coordinates are low dimension Euclidean coordinates that are assigned to every node in the system. And they're assigned in a special way such that the Euclidean distance between two coordinates is a good predictor of latency. So the idea is that you can measure your, this measure your latency between you and a few other nodes. Uh, acquire coordinates, and then predict the latency to any node in the system. So you can imagine network coordinates taking this complicated picture to the left. You have multiple APs, hot potato routing, uh, peering shortcuts, very hard to reason about. And turn it into a simple picture, uh, just nodes in a grid, that you can reason about easily with just some simple local computation. OK, so this is something I thought it's called Vivaldi. And it's a decentralized <coughs> algorithm to choose network coordinates. So. Systems like D hash. Oh, go ahead. Sort of a high level question. I mean, why do network coordinates work at all? Uh, That's something I'll talk about. It's actually surprising to me that they worked. They worked at all. Yeah, one thing I can think of is um, they probably work because uh, the, the delay is dominated by transmission delay, and then and, and, and not the congestion as playing or like bandwidth or anything like that. Yeah, that, that's okay. that's our theory too. But I'll definitely get to that in a, a few slides. How, how good or how bad would, would uh, latitude and longitude or any of the surrogates work in network coordinates? I think if you could force every node to give you a lot long, it might it would probably work OK. Yeah, ask him for his phone number. <laughs> Area code might work. Area code would work. That's possible. We'd, the nice thing about these coordinates is uh, that they don't require any input from the user. Yeah. It's an automatic system. And also, sometimes area code doesn't work you know, if you are roaming or something. Yeah. So this is an automatic system, which is uh, definitely it. All right, so yeah, uh, no, no, no special nodes in dehash, so no central nodes that we can ask to be landmarks as a system like, the existence is like GMP requires. <coughs> so if all totally decentralized, it makes it easy to deploy in these distributed systems, but it's just as accurate as the landmark approaches that are out there now. Uh, it, it converges very quickly, so if you start up a new system, these coordinates uh, are accurate pretty fast. And it's cheap to run because we can piggyback measurements we need on existing dehash traffic. So this coordinate problem. Oh, go ahead. So one more higher question: Why did you decide not to use landmarks just because you wanted a completely distributed solution, or was there something else? Yeah, it's it's for, for a system like Dhash where every node is exactly the same. It's uh, it's difficult to to tag certain nodes as landmarks. And actually, uh, I think Vivaldi has lowered the the threshold for using coordinate systems. Vivaldi has been adopted in several other uh, distributed systems, whereas GMP wasn't as uh, wasn't as widely used outside of. Simply answer coordinates is good. All right, so the, the problem with coordinates is finding coordinates that minimize uh, some error function. So you can imagine for every node, for every pair of nodes, there's an actual latency. And the coordinates are currently making some prediction about the latency. So we'd like to minimize the sum of all these relative errors over the whole system. To pick what? Oh, you need an absolute value. I'm just being. Oh, yeah, sorry. You're right. Because otherwise, the answer is P is actually bigger than zero, but that's for all nodes. Yeah, the quantity on top has to be positive. Never mind. All right, so we're going we're gonna to minimize this error by simulating the behavior of a mass spring system. So you can imagine between every set of nodes a spring, the rest length of that spring is uh, the actual distance between the nodes. And the 
current length of the spring is the predicted distance. That's the, so if the nodes are too close in the coordinate space, the spring will be compressed. It'll force them apart. If you let the system sort of wobble around for a while, eventually it'll settle on coordinates that uh, minimize uh, an air function just like this one. So of course, we, can't, we don't have global knowledge of the system, so we're going to simulate that spring system on, in, in a decentralized manner. So let's watch Vivaldi in action. So I've plotted three nodes here on this uh, grid that's sometimes gray and sometimes blue, depending on the projector. It's like gray today. And uh, what I've shown is the position of the nodes in this, in this 2D coordinate space. So coordinate updates are going to happen as nodes contact each other. So first we show node A contacting node B, and it learns two things after the communication. First it learns the round trip time to B. It can just measure that, how long that RPC took. And also learns B's coordinates. So once it has that knowledge, it can break out its coordinate ruler. And it's usually in the coordinate space that's about 40 milliseconds apart. But it measured 20 milliseconds, so it knows that its coordinates are inaccurate. So it's going to adjust its position by moving towards B. Uh, you can see its old position here in gray. And now it's a, a zero error with respect to B. And this continues as Since we have moved in a sort of a linear line, there are, there are probably many ways to move towards B that would give you 20 milliseconds in latency. Yeah, you can move anywhere in a circle around. Yeah. B. It chooses to move directly towards B. Okay. That's a. Yeah, I hadn't thought of. Uh, I hadn't thought of any other way. But this is this is sort of the analogy of the spring system, right? Because the spring pools directly towards B. And so this obviously has to happen with more than one node. Uh, so A talks to C, learns it's 50 milliseconds away. The coordinate system says 30. So it's going to go ahead and move out to 50 to make the error zero. Note that A has changed its position with respect to B, so it's not as good a fit as it used to be, but it's still much better than it was originally. And as nodes continue to this over time, talking to some set of nodes, eventually the, we will find a, a global, excuse me, a global set of coordinates that predict latency well. All right. So before we consider how well works on the internet, is this a 3D space or a 2D space? That was a 2D space. The choice of coordinate space is arbitrary. I'll talk well, a little. Well, if you had a 3D space, you could go to a spot that was, was yeah, the choice of the coordinate space is going to impact uh, how well the system works, actually. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a few slides. So when you, when you pick the new position, there are a couple of different things you could do, right? You could try to move, as you said, towards that node. Mm -hmm. The sole aim of minimizing error towards the node that you last made it. That's right. Or you could try to move to a position where the sum total of error uh, to all nodes is Yeah, when what you're actually trying to minimize is, sure, the, the error to all the nodes. Of course, you don't know the distance to all the nodes, so you can't do that. We did play around with keeping a window of the last few nodes we talked to, and that didn't, it did improve things. So in the interest of simplicity, we uh, eliminated Yeah, higher dimensional space definitely worked better. In fact, if you had an n squared dimensional space, it worked perfectly. Exact That's right. Yeah. Uh, There's going to be a discussion of coordinate space in a bit. Okay. Maybe I can defer these questions. <coughs> this, this, this is what I was saying. So, could you go back one slide? Yeah. So, so okay. So, so when he is now trying to move from, um, he's trying to correct the distance to C. That's right. Uh, it uh, it moved back, right? Mm -hmm. um, it paid no attention to what happened to its distance from B, which it knows from the last That's right. And, milliseconds. Right, and we did play around with, so you can imagine it remembering that it just talked to B. Right, and it was 20 milliseconds. Maybe it should move somewhere a little bit. Right. Yeah. And, and if you iterate that process, what you'll find out is that it's going to converge in the place where the new circle is going to set. Right. So, so it, it actually comes out to the right fit. Because it's going to talk to B again later, probably, anyways. It's just uh, keeping right. the. And the property that this has for three nodes and Well, this is exactly the next uh, discussion. So before we play around with complicated things about uh, you know, actually embedding the internet into a metric space, let's, let's consider a much simpler problem and just, just iron out some fine points in the algorithm. So we're going to run Vivaldi on this, uh, this extremely artificial data set. I've put points in a 2D Euclidean space and set the latencies between them to be Euclidean distances between them. So Vivaldi better be able to find the right answer to this 
this because this is, you know, we're finding Euclidean coordinates for Euclidean distances. So let me show you what will happen if we run the algorithm I just described to you uh, on this data set. So here's the nodes uh, trying to find good coordinates. As you can see, they're, uh, they're not doing a very good job. I didn't run that forever, but trust me, they oscillate forever. They never find uh, appropriate coordinates. That's because they make these really large moves in ID space. So they try to correct the entire error at once, and they end up jumping over any minimum and then jumping back. So to get this to actually settle down to some reasonable set of coordinates, we're going to damp the motion by moving only some fraction of the way towards the point that would minimize our error. So in this case, we'll move just 5% of the way uh, towards that point. So the nodes move much more slowly, but uh, as they settle down near the minimum, they actually do reconstruct uh, the original grid. What's the black box? Yeah, the, the little tail shows you how, how far it's gone. So note that we only care about reconstructing the relative distances. So if this grid is rotated or you know, flipped somehow, that's fine. It's only the relative orientations that matter. All right, that was great that we got the system to converge, but we sacrificed a lot of convergence speed to guarantee convergence. We'd like as an adaptive system. So <coughs> what are the choice of delta depend on? Nuclear delta equals one number, or can you say five percent? That's a pretty low value. Right? right, so exactly. So we'd, it'd be great if we didn't configure this, right? Fewer parameters are always better, in my opinion. So we're going we're gonna to let the system itself choose delta. So we're going to have each node keep an error estimator. So every time a node makes a prediction, if I'm going to talk to some other node, it can check to see how accurate its prediction was. And it'll just keep an exponentially weighted moving average of how accurate its predictions were. Uh, if that error estimator is high, it's willing to move a long way. It believes that its coordinates are somehow untrustworthy. If that error is very low, it's not as willing to move as quickly. It believes it's in a spot that, that it's pretty happy with. All right, so let's see what happens if we use this adaptive estimate. So nodes move quickly at first, and then slowly settle down, so we should get a faster convergence. I see they quickly zoom to something near the right spot and then slowly settle to, to the correct positions. You don't have any more signals Yeah, this is this is purely artificial. No noise and communication pattern is just random here. Uh I believe it's it's a few random nodes. I forget exactly how many. This is all based on Somebody taking their location to somebody else. And That's right. That. So how does how do, how do I decide who I talk to? Uh, each node was initialized with a random neighborhood, a random set of nodes that it talks to in the beginning. It talks always within that set. Okay. And, and I don't recall in these artificial tests uh, exactly how large that set it's is. It's kind of login type size. You know, I, I can't figure. I can I can only tell you exper uh, experimentally, but in our 2,000 node simulations, about 32 neighbors was enough to get. Randomly chosen out of the entire. Right. If you choose funny neighbors, like if you only talk to the nodes that are next to you in the uh, eventual coordinate space, you can get problems with the, the coordinates twisting back upon themselves. So you need some long distance links to make a thing you know, sort of fold out. But uh, yeah, the more, the more people you talk to, the better your coordinates get and the faster you converge. But you don't need to talk to that many to still get a conversion. Good. All right, so one more thing about this. Uh, let the algorithm before we move on to see work on the internet. Uh, so we noticed that when new nodes joined the system, they had a disruptive effect on existing nodes. And that happens because when a new node joins, its coordinates are essentially random. And anyone that talks to it uh, will get a very bad prediction. So uh, if I talk to a new node, I might, re might think uh, mistakenly that I should change my position radically uh, because I'm not doing predicting well. So in this demo, we're going to have half the nodes in this grid join. I think they're colored blue, and then another half will join, and we'll see that the, the existing nodes get disrupted. So the first half of the grid, this is, I guess the left half is going to settle down, and then when the other half comes in, uh, mm -hmm. the nodes that had found reasonably, reasonably good coordinates uh, were completely disrupted, and so two bad things happened. Uh, first, the conversion had to start all over, because the system was essentially re-randomized. And the second thing is that while the new nodes were joining, <laughs> the existing nodes could no longer make good predictions. So we'd like to tweak, we can fix this by tweaking delta so that how far you move depends not only on what your est error estimator is, but what the remote node's error estimator is. So if you have a very low error estimator and the remote node's a very high error estimator, we can use this fraction to set delta, it'll essentially just ignore whatever information he's giving you. So old wise nodes and ignore young naive nodes. And here's what that looks like. So the, the first nodes form up, and when the red nodes come in, the blue nodes 
simply ignore their approach. So that was great because A, the blue nodes were still able to make good predictions, and the whole system converged faster uh, because the red nodes were, were the system wasn't re-randomized. Uh, two, two, two questions. Uh -huh. One, if by chance that the, new no the, the red nodes were started at the other end of the blue nodes and crystallized there, would there be a way to get them to pass through and get the right order? Oh, the two start? systems had converged independently and then you mix them up? The so not even independently. You know, you, you start at random and you, and you throw red nodes and, and, then other, and they start on the wrong side and then there's, they have a lot of inertia not to move through the, the blue nodes and uh, to the right place. Can that happen? It could happen if the red nodes were only talking to themselves. If the uh, communication pattern was such that you had, you know, mm -hmm. basically two distinct systems, and then you added links between them. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a difficult. Re I mean, it would work because they would both have low estimators, so they would believe each other. But you end up with the first case where just re-randomized, basically. It does. So, you have something else? And the other is, you know, uh, two D coordinate on Earth may be a good estimate. They are certainly not precise. Try to do the latency between between uh, uh, the Damascus and Tel Aviv, and you'll find some interesting numbers. So yeah, in fact, in fact, that's actually exactly the next discussion. Oh, sorry. This doesn't seem very robust to malicious behavior. It is not robust to malicious behavior. Yeah. If you a node lies about its coordinates or, it, or its error estimator, it can distort the uh, the space around it. There's been a little bit of work in uh, making these coordinate systems robust to malicious nodes. Uh, Miguel Castro, and your sister Levin in Cambridge, looked at that a little bit. But didn't in their in their OSDI paper about securing pastry, they have to get rid of most of their latency optimizations and say, I just follow kind of my strict neighbors? That was the only way they could reason that nodes couldn't hijack large portions of the routing space. Right. And they have a separate, they have, Miguel has his own coordinate system called PIC. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. And they have a, maybe that's, there's a sort of a security test in the OSDI paper where, you know, if you forward me to some node, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like the nodes are really dense enough where you forward me. It must be a, a bad, you must be a bad guy. Here they have something similar where if I talk to a node and it seems like he really vi violates the triangle inequality badly, like he probably would if he's trying to lie to me, maybe I don't trust him. So, um, okay. Of the real network violates the triangle inequality fairly badly. Yeah, so it's it's a tricky test. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how well I think that'll work. All the simulations you've shown, you've got these complete but one rectangles. Uh, it's a bug in the movie generator. Not a limitation of the algorithm. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it does work great on grids, minus the uh, movie bug. But uh, there's a whole other question, which is, you know, it's great that it converges on a grid, but will it converge on the internet? And you know, is there anything to converge to? Is the internet embeddable in these Euclidean spaces? And sort of surprisingly, at least to me, the answer is yes, it's, it's fairly embeddable. Uh, so here I've shown the cumulative distribution function of the link errors, the link prediction errors for a, a data set consisting of the latencies between all the planet lab nodes. So we fitted this to five dimensional coordinates, and the dark blue line is Vivaldi. As you can see, the median prediction errors are median yeah, prediction errors around 15% relative error, which is uh, pretty good for our application. It'll certainly keep us from going to uh, Europe when we might have gone just down the street. I should also note that there's a, a few nodes that have very bad prediction errors. Some nodes just aren't predicted well. Five? Five D? Why five? I think 5D is the coordinate system chosen by GNP. So this is just a comparison to GNP. We're being as fair to them as possible. Um, this other thing you learn from this graph is that uh, Vivaldi does about as well as GNP. <coughs> GNP is pretty sensitive to the way its landmarks are placed. Um, so I ran it with 64 different sets of random landmarks, and I plotted the best result. Uh, the worst result's pretty bad. The median result is, I think, slightly, slightly below, GNP, below Vivaldi. But the two, the two perform similarly. They're both finding, basically, the embedding you want to find. Right, so why do these work at all? And this is, I guess this is the really surprising part. And to try to handle that, I've shown uh, in two dimensions now the coordinates chosen by the system running on Planet Lab. This is the, uh, the real Planet Lab, not Planet Lab in simulation. And I've labeled these clusters that form based on a geographic location. So there's a large cluster in the center for North America, and it has you know, east and west coast nodes. Europe, which you might expect, is off the east coast. Korea, off the west coast. Australia, sort of, where you might expect. And the conclusion we draw from seeing that this China's interesting, China's interesting uh, uh, question. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But um, 
what we can learn immediately, I think, is that these coordinates work mostly because um, transmission time is the main factor. And if the main thing that influences my latency to another node is the distance on the surface of the Earth, well, we might expect that we can embed that in Euclidean space because it's, you know, exists in Euclidean space. Yes. How did you go from that five in space yeah. to this Oh, this is just a different experiment. This is the experiment. My, my this is running in 2D, so I can put it on the side. The, the result you ought to get is that if you can, I mean, if it's really geographic distance, then it makes sense you can embed it in a 3D space since real space is three dimensional. Sure. But it's not at all obvious why it ought to work in a 2D space. I'll get to that. This is mainly 2D, so I can, you know, put it on the slide. I mean, I, you can imagine 3D definitely works better. And you might imagine, I mean, you can. <laughs> It, it does turn out the earth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're joking about the earth being flat, but I'll get to that later. Also, fairly more to the to the issue would be, you know, that your um, that your mapping can converge at some point and wrap around. I assume that's why China's where it is. Okay, China's where it is because China could, in this test, the Chinese node had very poor connectivity. Uh, packet loss was like 95 percent. The only nodes it could talk to were a couple in the U.S. So it's extremely unconstrained. So I think you know if you'd watch this over time, China would just be orbiting around the U.S. <laughs> at the correct distance. So uh, when I happen to freeze it, <laughs> that's where China ended up. So yeah, you do need enough neighbors to actually pin yourself down. So I mean that's that's sort of not bad for China. I mean at least the U.S. knows not to use China, right? So and the coordinates they don't they're not designed to to figure out latitude and longitude. You know from the perspective of the system, displacement for China is really <laughs> probably just about as good as any placement you can imagine. Oh yeah, so right, the speed of light, you know, not not that great really compared to the surface of the Earth, and um, you know we keep improving our results every year. But the physicists, their fundamental results are just not improving. The speed of light, it's uh, <laughs> where it's been for a while. So, so okay, yeah. What's that? Do I have hop counts for like? Well, so okay, so you've done this, this absolute ping. Right. I don't recover the hop counts. Yeah, it, it, that if, for instance, it, is, is hop time going through router dominate the, the speed of light? And what you're not showing is, is I mean, it, it doesn't, I obviously recognize it doesn't make any difference mm -hmm. for purely network traffic, but I'm just curious. It does. What you'll notice when you look at these pictures long enough is that the oceans are way too small. Yeah. And that's because packets go really hops. fast across oceans, and they slow down over no the ocean. Right. So, <laughs> exactly. So, but. Well, one thing to remember is, uh, I showed these pictures, people think I'm trying to figure out where nodes are. And maybe you know, the NSA would think it's a great idea. But I don't, I don't actually care that the pictures look like geog geography, as long as they give me the right answer. And this is just the geography just lets us know why this might work at all. All right, well, we think we're actually fitting nodes on the surface of the Earth. That might influence how we choose uh, coordinate spaces. Let's talk a little bit about that. The first thing to notice is that no space based on Euclidean distance is going to work perfectly. Uh, those all satisfy the triangle inequality, for instance. And we know the internet does not. So we're never going to get a perfect embedding as long as you use Euclidean space. And we also know that higher dimensional spaces work better. The algorithm more room to play with, it will find a set of coordinates that make the error smaller. But there's not much win after about 3D. So it's sort of not surprising if, we're, if we're, what we are fitting is the surface of the Earth. Uh, you know, it's not 4D last time I checked. So. Um, and you know, we could just we could just use like a nine-dimensional model, and that seems to work okay. But we'd really like the smallest possible model. Um, for one thing, we're we're putting these coordinates in every single packet we send, so we don't need to pack. We certainly couldn't pack n squared coordinates in there, uh, which would fit perfectly, of course. So we'd like the smallest possible model that works well. Uh, somebody mentioned spherical coordinates. Uh, in fact, the Earth is flat from the perspective of Vivaldi. There's no real wraparound in these networks, apparently, according to all the data sets I can look at. Now, if you give this algorithm a sphere to work with. The bigger you make the sphere, the better the fit gets, because it's just using one side of the sphere to approximate a plane. <laughs> and I think what's happening is there's basically no links between, say, Southeast Asia and the Middle East. So if you send a packet from Korea to Israel, it goes across the Pacific Ocean, North America, the Atlantic, through Europe to Israel. All roads really do go through. <laughs> yeah, well, it seems like in the internet, all roads go through New York. I don't know. It's another thing I've heard. But uh, maybe not here. This is half off subject, but there's a book, The Pentagon's New Map. Writing the word the core and the gap. Yes. And yes. if you look at the, and essentially this is a flat Earth map with the same gap between Southeast Asia and Southwest Asia. 
I, I've seen that map actually. Yeah, it did, it did remind me of this problem. The gap, the gap does not have good network connectivity. But if the gap gets filled, how much will this break? If the gap gets filled, yeah. If there really was a lot of good wrappers, we should probably use spherical coordinates then. So. That's a good question. There are no computers in India? No, we don't have them with these. And the packets are made up. And through Japan? No, I think it's Quark. That would be very useful. Most of the links are go to, that I know of, I think it's all the same place. And then the other So they do go through the Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so the reason that it fits in a 2D space is that there really is a cut. Exactly. All the time. I guess that makes sense. Yes. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's no problem. I mean, if this, if we did make the internet wrap around, then we want to revisit this obviously and use spherical coordinates if possible. Well, when we track when they install that link, your models communicate rapidly. That's right. And, it, and it's fine. more specific routes also cause a problem for this. <coughs> say there are particular routes that uh, ISP for whatever reason. You know, selling to a particular customer and only lets their traffic go over it, but other people have to take some slower. Yeah, sure. So, like private sharing links, um, they they can distort these coordinates. That's where a lot of the error comes from. I think is some of these strange routes. So, I mean, they're, they're definitely bad nodes. And that, that's probably one possibility for for why they're so bad. All right, we're going to propose another uh, coordinate space. It's based on our intuition of what's happening <laughs> in the network. We think it's a very simple coordinate space, uh, which works pretty well. And we call it the uh, height vector model. So it's like three, chord, three components, an x and a y position that are in a two-dimensional plane, and then a height above that plane. And this is supposed to capture the idea of nodes that are attached to a fast core network by slow access links. Uh, so this models things like queues well, and uh, something like a, you know, an analog modem that has a slow, a slow transmission time. So just to give you an, an intuition for what happens when you actually use this system, we ran this on the nodes in Planet Lab testbed. There's one node in Brazil in this testbed. And it happened that every node, every packet that Brazilian node sent went through New York first. So when we ran the coordinates, uh, I looked at the height vector for the Brazilian node. And its XY happened to be right over New York City, right over the NYU node. It seemed like a bug at first. But they realized that its height was uh, a good approximation of the distance between Brazil and New York. So to this model, that node looked like it was you know, cable mode in New York with an 80 millisecond queue. So that's the kind of thing we were hoping this model would capture. It seems to do it pretty well. And um, besides being sort of intellectually satisfying, it does perform better than uh, Euclidean coordinates. Uh, not surprisingly, it does better than 2D coordinates, the dotted line on the bottom, because it's more information to work with. It also does better than 3D Euclidean coordinates. And in fact, I didn't plot those lines. It does better out to about 5D, 16 beyond start working a little better. So we think this is a, it's a good choice for coordinate spaces. All right, let me show you one more movie to motivate this slide. Uh, this, is the, this is the algorithm running on simulated Planet Lab data. So you can see it forming a couple clusters. One thing you notice, it's always kind of bouncing around. It's not because of noise in the simulation, but because of randomness in the, no, in the set of nodes that the nodes are talking to. You also might notice if you watch carefully, it's translating slightly. Uh, that's fine. It's only the relative errors that matter. So uh, the, the system will do that. But because it's always measuring and always bouncing around, go ahead. Translating slightly isn't really fine in the long term if like all of my doubles hit their max. I hadn't thought about that one. But uh it's gonna take a while. Yeah, maybe maybe my uh, my floats will run out. That's possible. I've certainly never run it long enough to see that. But. You don't know how long it's gonna take, right? Because numerical error is is like that. Another, Everybody more... will continue to check and say, I'm close, I'm close, I'm close. But if they're walking, if they're walking at a linear pace, there's no. Why do you think they'll be walking at a linear pace? He has no stabilization. A more pressing problem than uh, float error, which I hadn't thought of, is that uh, <laughs> is that if you um, if you cache a position, it'll get stale eventually. So you do have to use these coordinates while they're still a little bit fresh. That's been finding applications so far. If you want to peg this thing down, you could pick a few landmarks and just tell them their coordinates. And that would, uh, that would anchor it. But yeah, but the plus side of uh, sort of constantly measuring your position does cause you to bounce around, but also to adapt the change in the network. So here's an experiment that I ran on the Georgia Tech uh, topology, transit stuff topology. And the y-axis shows the median error of the system, and the x-axis shows time. 
So as the system starts up, uh, it qu quickly converges to some coordinates that predict error pretty well. This is uh, absolute error this time, sorry, not relative error. And at time 100, I change one of those transit stub lengths. I make it 10 times longer. So the coordinates the nodes had no longer predict on this new system. So you can see that the error shoots up there at time 100. But since the system is constantly measuring, uh, it quickly drops back down. It doesn't drop down to the original error because this new topology is harder to fit than the old one. At uh, time 300, I revert the topology. And it, uh, the nodes, again, find coordinates and now predict latency for the new topology. So the time it takes to converge again is about 20 seconds. It has a lot to do with how fast you measure. Here, every node kept one ping outstanding. So it's doing about four or five measurements a second. Uh, why does it, uh, it, I don't know how significant this is, but it looks like it got The better. right's lower in the left, right? Yeah, yeah, everybody asked that. I think that's just because uh, by shaking the system, it found a slightly different minima. It's a little better. Sort of a simulated annealing effect. In fact, it's still, I mean, it's been, it's still improving. It's the, the improvement process never really ended, right? Uh, this is, yeah, you think this might go a little bit lower if we let it run longer? In fact, longer? it looks like a continuation of the previous one. I mean, it looks like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't like think. At 100, it hadn't stabilized yet, and then when you reverted, it still didn't stabilize. I don't think that's the case. I don't think it would have gotten this good if we hadn't, hadn't banged it. I think this is, this is pretty much flat, I think. Really? It does. Which looks like, looks like we connect to me. Yeah, I've started these graphs for a while. It, it, it can be very frustrating. It's hard to say. It, 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 these, these spring algorithms are definitely finding local minima. Look, there's a lot of local minima that are very similar. So, you know, they bounce around, they go up and down a little bit. It's, uh, it can be pretty maddening. But, uh, yeah, so in a landmark system, you might have to periodically decide to, you know, reach the landmarks to rebind their coordinates, which is how landmarks again. This system very naturally adapts to network changes. All right, that's the end of the Vivaldi section. Any uh, outstanding Vivaldi questions? Sure. Uh, some of the other math things that work in computer science well, like balance trees, mm -hmm. it's very easy to figure, to kind of reason, it seems to me, about how they will always work for many, many different things. Whereas uh, it seems to me like the 2D coordinates, I, I have a concern about the 2D coordinates. For one thing, you know, they have the local minima, they have the vulnerability to kind of symmetry where I can flip from one side to the other. And uh, it seems like that can be kind of that might, I don't see why it wouldn't be the case that like you introduce one new node and it might cause kind of one of these global hmm. realignments. Not necessarily on the scale of the internet, but it seems like a not, you know, one nice property that one might hope for of something that can scale to the internet is that it would also work if I simply deployed it on a, cl on a cluster. In which case I might not be able to count on kinds of nice, uh, these nice stability properties that you get from everything actually being spread out on uh, in real space. What are your thoughts on just how reliable is this? Yeah, I think this work, I think the coordinates work mainly because of the geographic spread of the nodes. Uh, I, if you put this in a cluster where latency starts to be dominated by, you know, processing time or, you know, how lucky you are to catch the interrupt at the right time, I doubt, I doubt you can, for instance, figure out which machine, which rack a machine is in, in a machine room with this, with this approach. Just that's probably not, the delays probably aren't embeddable very well in a, uh, in a low-dimensional Euclidean space. Yeah, so, what? I wonder about those. In the first half of the talk, you said you were going to mess with the finger tables to make them not be random. And the second half of the talk, you have this randomly selected neighbor set. So if you were to um, select the neighbor set from the volume from, it could be mostly, Mostly notes from a group, right. and then a couple ones that look like the, the, the next links. Is that going to mess with your Yeah, there's a tension here. If you only talk to local nodes, you get coordinates to predict local distances very well and predict. Well, if you only, only talk to local nodes, then what you'll get is a bunch of coordinate systems that are laid over top of each other, and it doesn't matter. Right, so if you only talk to local nodes, that's, it's, but it's that's moved. That's not what you have. What you have is a, a, a situation where you talk to local nodes preferentially. Exactly. Yeah, and I didn't show any, any graphs here, but we, um, we looked at how sensitive the system was to having fewer and fewer long-distance links in the neighbor set. As long as it's a very small fraction of long-distance links, uh, you're fine. What does very small fraction mean? I don't remember the number offhand. It was, it, was, it was less than a third. I think it was like 10%. 10% of your links are long. 
Yeah, because you, you hear a successor list, which is randomly chosen. Right. And if the system's working, it's talking to nodes that are. Well, those are the only. Well, I guess, yeah, they're, they're connect when you're making actual connections. So. But the problem with the only local nodes is you can get the, this cube to fold on itself, and that's, a, that's problematic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's nice to piggyback on yeah. on uh, local nodes, but if you wanted to, you could you could run a few lookups with the proximity optimizations off, and just and get a nice sampling of uh, I don't know, if, if if that was a problem. Yeah, it would be a great problem to have if we only talk to local nodes. So that would mean our uh, proximity is working really well. Maybe it's a natural feedback. If you if you only if you're too good, then you break the coordinates, so you end up talking to far away nodes. Still have a lot of experience with that. Maybe. Or maybe it's a disaster when it happens, and then all of a sudden your latency estimates get all off and talk to new people. But then maybe, probably maybe it would fix itself. I don't know. You can also like higher grade, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it, we, it's not like we've. Uh, I've certainly never seen it do that. We've, we've never really gotten the, uh, the communication so local. Just because there's only, there's only so many uh, replicas, so every once in a while you get unlucky. Well, not only that, if you ever do the store, you have to talk to all yeah, of them. Yeah, when you do the store, you definitely have to, to write it all. Talk to all of them, so it probably really happen. And, and your successor is random <laughs> in geographic space. So. I mean, and for, for Usenet, where I bet the, the write to read ratio is bigger than the author's so like to think it is. Um. Yeah, I'm sure it's pretty high. Usenet seems almost right only. Uh, so we've been playing with these DHCs for a while now. We've actually got one running in Planet Lab. Uh, and it's working pretty well. We've, the latency is low enough that when you run using on this thing, it's, uh, it feels a lot like a normal Usenet server. The throughput's pretty good. We've been inserting most of the text groups uh, into Planet Lab. We don't have a lot of space on the Planet Lab node, so we can't even come close to fitting the binaries in there. So we've run into a new problem that we might have expected. Uh, now that we've got a lot of data in the system, maintaining all that data is becoming pretty expensive. So you know, as nodes leave the system, DS has to do something about that. As the replication level drops when a node leaves, uh, it creates a new, a new fragment. And that might be very expensive. Every time a node leaves, we're forced to create a new copy. So this is the latest problem we're addressing right now. And one thing we notice is that most of our joins and leaves are caused by nodes temporarily failing and returning. And if that's the case, we can buffer against these temporary failures by creating a few extra copies. So if the user asks us to create two copies of a block, we actually create could, for instance, create three when one node leaves. As long as that node comes back before a second node leaves, we won't have to do any work. So the question is, how many copies do we need to create, and when should we create them? For instance, if we put a copy of every block on every node in the system at the beginning of time, well, we'd certainly be done working, uh, but uh, it would probably be a little bit of overkill. So here's a simple algorithm that does what we think is the right thing. Uh, if there's less than R copies, we better create a new one, because we promised the user we'd have R. If there's more than R copies, we'll do nothing. And the do nothing part's important. If you try to do something clever like garbage got extra copies, as this actually will not work well at all. So this works great if nodes fail but come back. If nodes fail permanently, uh, this algorithm won't work too well. But if that's the case, uh, you won't have a system <coughs> for very long anyway, so your problems will be over pretty soon. So we think this increase the right number of copies. So we think of what that number of copies might be. We can imagine a simple uh, probabilistic experiment. So if a node's available with probability p, uh, imagine a coin bias to that probability. And now we're going to, when we know how, we know how many times we're going to flip that coin until we get r heads. So that corresponds to how many copies we have out there on live and dead nodes. So that every time we go to ask for a copy, uh, there's usually r of those available. So you can do a little uh, tail bound. You find about two r over p copies are necessary before you're very likely to have r available every time you go to look for it. And in plan algebra, something like p is 0.8, this is a pretty reasonable number. And so the bottom line for maintenance overhead is that if you want to store a byte of data in the system for about four months, you're going to spend another six bytes uh, to get availability of the data over time. So pretty reasonable overhead for storing a lot of data in the system. OK, so you notice I didn't talk a lot about trust in this system. We mentioned a lot about malicious nodes. We give Vivaldi some problems. Uh, we do assume a trust environment right now, and this is something I'd like to work on in the future. So one way to do this problem would be just to punt on it. We'll run in some environment where everyone trusts each other. We might run all the desktop machines at Microsoft or within a university, 
And uh, others have, have oh, pointed that. that. Those would be two disjunctive steps, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> anyway, not me though. I see. Well, actually, I was talking to Intel guys about this. They seem very interested in running DH on all the PCs at Intel. Uh, they do drug tests. We know. We know. Well, keep that in mind. I'm, well, I'm about to talk about some of the social aspects of the system, so uh, that could be an important one. Uh, sort of another way to punt on this problem to some extent is to think about uh, having the user explicitly tell you which machines they might trust. So the real problem about with trust in DHT is that you end up talking to random machines and storing your data on uh, machines that you have no control over. So you might imagine routing instead over links uh, in a social network where you actually know the person you're talking to, and uh, therefore, for some reason, believe they might not throw your data on the floor. So some reasonable applications might run on this, something like backup, IAM, where you might not want your messages to go to AOL server where they apparently can even copyright them now. So I think this might be an interesting way to organize systems instead of on random graphs. So there's a lot of work in this area. Uh, Core is a scalable lookup protocol, one of the early ones. Since then, there's been a number of follow-ons. Uh, most of these, like I said, play <laughs> with it. Another funny slide that I think was funny. No, it just, you were calling all the other ones follow-ons. It was sort of a, a par parallel invention of, of the first few. Yeah. So some like mine. Sure, these, these three were all at the same time as Core. Uh, okay. And the rest were, uh, were later. Uh, yeah, for instance, one hop, as you might guess by the name, requires one hop because it keeps total state. Uh, Kellips is square root and constant. So there's been, you can choose your trade-off, basically, there. Uh, there's a bunch of DHTs out there. LH star and DDS is sort of the intellectual foundation of this work. Those are DHTs that use total knowledge, sort of machine room DHTs. Um, Open DHT is an interesting project where it's being run as a service rather than as a library. So instead of asking volunteers to run those, uh, it's a very brave graduate student who's actually managing a DHT and letting anyone they want use it. Uh, we certainly didn't invent PNS. Uh. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's uh, braver than I am. At any rate. So proximity neighbor selection is not something that uh, we came up with, but it's something we help, I think, understand a little bit better. We're mostly inspired by the Gumadi geometry paper. Uh, and in the data movement side, we're I've really been influenced by this uh, PIC2 paper that appeared at Hot OS that said you couldn't have a big network and a lot of data and uh, nodes that come up and down. So they say you can only have two of those. And our goal is just so that we can actually have all three in certain conditions. Um, in terms of latency, GMP was the first coordinate paper. But of all these, the first decentralized coordinates. But uh, been, you can have a choice of many different coordinate spaces at this point. Uh, interesting one to me is, is the work in sensor networks. So there they, try to, they, be, they have a little bit of extra challenge. They better get the right answer, since the sensors are definitely in a Euclidean space. And they're actually measuring physical distances. So um, the bar is a little higher for them. And of course, you can't go to system conference these days without falling over a paper based on a DHT. Everything from mail servers and network architectures, file sharing, uh, distributed citation. Uh, at least in the research world, a very popular tool for building systems. All right. So we hope these uh, DHTs do make it easier to build systems. Uh, there's a lot of things to be overcome to get these actually very useful in the wide area. We think our optimizations a good start towards this. It's pretty usable uh, for us, at least. And one nice thing is that some of the optimizations we've made to get dehash running are useful elsewhere. But Valdi, in particular, seems to be getting used uh, by a number of people that aren't in my particular research group. So you're free to download the source code. Like I said, the license should be Microsoft friendly. And if you're very brave, you can actually connect to this uh, port on Planet Lab and try to throw some data blocks in there if uh, you feel the need. So thanks a lot. I'll take any questions that are Leftover. I'm wondering how big, how big these blocks are and how long the transfer time is relative. Yeah, so the blocks are very small. It's optimized for eight kilobyte blocks. So the transfer time is, uh, is, dom is dominated by the latency. So you're, only, you're trying to minimize the latency of the lookup and the catch of that one block? Yeah, that's what I talked about today is so the operation. Not the way we build our systems. Um, we tend to do things like chop up a whole file system with a ton of blocks and spread them over the entire system. So you end up doing a lookup per per block. Of course, when you're doing a bulk download, that like that throughput actually becomes more important. So you can do a lot of lookups in parallel. 
So then you can end up saturating access link. So you're getting a, a file that's just spread out all over the whole That's right. right. That's so right. Is, is that why there's the problems with the, uh, the transport? Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you download, you don't download eight big file in 8K chunks, you talk to a thousand different machines. And you know, setting up a thousand TCP connections is not the right thing to do, it turns out. Well, feel free to. But is there anything else I didn't answer? No, I'd just be interested in more transport issues. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very interesting uh, thing. I just didn't have time to squeeze both latency and throughput into the same file. So when you do on in hops, how much, uh, how many bytes do you actually put on the network, even if they're all low latency? The, the number of bytes you use on the network does scale with, uh, with that. Sure. Is it close to the size of the block? Or is it well less than the size of the block? The number of bytes required to for the for the routing messages. Good. Yeah, the lookup messages. I think those packets are about 100 bytes or so. <laughs> the FCC headers and stuff. So, you know, we usually have four hop routes or five hop routes. So, it's still it's getting to be on the order of a fragment because the fragments are designed to fit in a packet. So the fragments are about 1,400 bytes byte packets. So, yeah, it's getting to be some reasonable fraction of those. Those packets. There's, I mean, there's obviously some price to pay for distributing your system. And no, I guess, does that argue for larger blocks? Or? Um, there's definitely a tension with how big to make the blocks. So larger blocks mean fewer lookups. So it saves, saves energy in terms of the, of the network. And you also might imagine improving throughput because you, uh, once you've found a block, you sort of download it very quickly. Of course, you can argue for smaller blocks. You may get load balance gets easier, and you have the potential to get very high throughput because you can do a lot of striping now. So we use 8K blocks. The other successful DHT is, is uh, OpenDHT that use, they use 1K blocks. Pastry always argued for whole files. So the idea is you'd, you'd find a, a file, and then you can just make a TCP connection and download it. So it's, um, it's still something of an open question. But, uh, All right, should we thank the speaker? All right.